Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Willem Mankies from the Council for Geoscience. Um, so I think uh, as part of introduction to this session, I'll, I'll obviously speak from the context of the Council for Geoscience in terms of uh, our role in contributing to um, enabling socioeconomic development, uh, obviously having a bit of a bias towards uh, the mining industry, uh, although um, some of the work that we do are obviously contributing to socioeconomic development broadly uh, and not specifically uh, only to the mining industry. Uh, but nonetheless, I'll, I'll have a focus a bit more on that. Um, so this is just a disclaimer to indicate that um, if you do want to use some of the contents of this presentation, you're welcome to reach out to the CGS uh, and, and get our approval uh, to make use of this, uh, unless obviously it's cited from uh, other sources. So maybe just by means of introduction, uh, for those that are not aware, um, the Council for Geoscience, obviously we are one of the uh, councils of government uh, in South Africa. Um, so we report to the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy. Uh, and uh, the CGS had been around for, for quite an extensive uh, time. We've been uh, formally established as the Geological Survey of South Africa around uh, 1912. Uh, and this year we are celebrating 111 years of existence. Uh, so this is quite important from our context uh, and our point of departure since uh, geoscience data and information, as I'll touch on uh, in a bit, uh, actually forms quite a big component of, uh, of the work that we do, especially legacy and historical information. And then with the advent of new technologies and innovation, we obviously can build on that um, and, and also uh, contribute to socioeconomic development. Uh, and I'll touch a bit on that uh, in a minute. Um, so we are established in terms of legislation. Uh, so the Geoscience Act, uh, I think that clearly sort of defines our mandate and the parameters in which we operate. Uh, it's quite a broad mandate, focus on research broadly, um, with the um, abilities to to be able to collaborate and partner with others uh, as well um so we've set out uh, sort of our motto back home is that geoscience is the fulcrum for human development uh, so a lot of the things that we do we really place that at the center of of our work uh, to be an enabler obviously there's a lot of other contributors and and other sort of cogs in the wheel that that also makes uh, everything move forward but surely uh, from a geoscience perspective we also uh, have quite a significant role to play um, and just to touch obviously our vision which is also our impact statement is to have a prosperous and transformed society enabled by geoscience solutions uh, so that's just some background so um, i won't also spend too much details in terms of how we've organized ourselves and and uh, sort of to realize and maximize our impact. Um, other than to say that we've divided our focus into what we've called thematic areas. Um, so those are in terms of minerals and energy, uh, geoscience for infrastructure and land use, health, groundwater, environment, innovation, which is uh, one of those cross-cutting things that we all as scientists have to innovate. Uh, and then also geoscience diplomacy, uh, which goes uh, beyond the borders of uh, of South Africa as well. Um, so I think maybe one important thing to to mention here is uh, being an entity of state, uh, we have to align to national development imperatives. Uh, I think they are clearly outlined, uh, our MTSF priorities, uh, all of these policies of government, uh, there have been quite a number of them uh, I think also to cite in our space, there is, for instance, the uh, Just Energy uh, energy Transition uh, and the IRP, uh, Integrated Resource Plan, uh, the Minerals uh, uh, Exploration Strategy of, of South Africa. Uh, so there, there are all of these policies uh, that, that we um, contribute to uh, at some or another level, uh, especially from a geoscience uh, perspective in terms of research and the work that we do. So, um, obviously, we live in a 
ever-changing world. Um, so we know, especially from the mining industry, um, it, it went through quite significant changes in the last couple of years, especially with the whole uh, climate change debate and the just uh, energy transition, uh, climate mitigation action. All of these things uh, had fundamentally started to shift the focus of uh, especially from our context, geoscience and then uh, exploration and mining activity subsequent to that, uh, to a lot of minerals that, uh, you know, in the past we didn't really pay a lot of attention to. Um, so this is purely to illustrate, you know, how some of these uh, changes uh, had sort of shifted our focus to look at um, mineral occurrences and, and the geology that hosts them uh, that had been known to some extent, but didn't really receive a lot of attention uh, because they weren't really pre prevalent uh, in, in previous sort of economic cycles uh, and technological development uh, cycles. Uh, so we all know, obviously, um, the so-called critical minerals. Uh, that is a lot of, lot of people are referring to that, uh, although I like to rather call them battery minerals or minerals of the future. Uh, so there's quite a lot of them um, that are required uh, as we go to materials intensity, for instance, uh, to develop these new technologies. Uh, so essentially from a geoscience point of view, uh, we have to basically find these minerals, uh, understand you know, their sort of distribution, where they are localized in, uh, uh, in concentrations, uh, and then the rest of the value chain um, follows onto that. Um, so before I go into that, also to mention, uh, especially from a socio-economic uh, and development perspective, I think uh, we all know South Africa has got quite a rich history of, of mining activities, uh, and it's it's for a long time been the backbone of our economy. Uh, I think we've diversified, obviously, in the in the in the past uh, couple of um, decades, but uh, still. Uh, mining remains quite a substantial component of our economy. Uh, and this is just some infographics uh, to sort of illustrate, you know, the direct employment and sort of contributions to the GDP. Um, but I, what, what I want to focus on is this uh, snippet from the uh, Minerals Council fact sheet uh, that they've had as a case study for one of the uh, junior exploration companies uh, in South Africa. Uh, and just the principle of how when you go from uh, exploration stages of a, a mineral project uh, into construction and then ultimately into mining. So there's uh, across the board from uh, revenue in terms of tax, the costs, uh, job creation potential, uh, quite significant improve or increases as you move up this value chain. Uh, ultimately, we want to get to a stage of mining. Um, and uh, I think as geoscientists, you know, we look at the mineral potential side of things, but also the uh, the environmental stewardship side of things as well. Groundwater infrastructure development, I think all of these things are interrelated. Uh, but the principle I wanted to make is just uh, from exploration to mining, there's a significant increase uh, in uh, across the board in, in, in um, the socioeconomic benefits. Um, but all of this starts ultimately with with geology and, you know, to find these minerals that we need. Um, so this is basically to illustrate the same thing. So we all know this mining uh, or mineral development uh, value chain, as it's uh, as it's known, as you go from uh, exploration activities all the way into mine production and, and beneficiation ultimately. Um, so, as a council for geoscience, we generally function in the minerals exploration space uh, at the very early stages uh, of this. So, we've uh, organized ourselves to um, to contribute to uh, what we call pre-competitive uh, geoscience data and information. Um, and what that is, is ultimately uh, geological information uh, that we collect uh, and also that's under our custodianship um, to ultimately de-risk uh, exploration projects and activities uh, way at the beginning of uh, uh, potential development projects. Um, so at the end of the day, um, when you start de-risking uh, exploration activities at the initial stages, 
the hope is that we can start accelerating uh, the uh, more detailed exploration activities that you know the private sector typically does uh, in the country, uh, and ultimately to lead to new um, mineral discoveries. Uh, ultimately, so that's that's the ultimate intent, uh, and this is um, aligned to the DMRE's uh, strategic intent as well to. Uh, as a country, as South Africa, to also secure five uh, percent of the global exploration expenditure. So uh, we know that the geology of South Africa um, is very good quality geology, so to speak, to put it plainly. Um, but current exploration activities are not commensurate with uh, with the quality of geology that we have. So we we really try to make information available and and undertake research specifically to. Uh, to de-risk some of these possible projects. Uh, so some of the ways that we do this, I'll just go through uh, uh, maybe some examples briefly. Um, but fundamentally, one of the backbone things that we do is to improve the uh, on and offshore geoscience mapping coverage uh, of South Africa. Uh, so the country had obviously been mapped uh, at different scales. Uh, I can illustrate it in this slide. Uh, so we've done one in one million scale, which is very broad uh, geology. Uh, then we went to a quarter million scale, which is a bit more detailed. Uh, but ultimately, what we need for uh, the initial stages of exploration activities is what we call a one in 50,000 scale uh, mapping. Uh, so I think it's quite clear how uh, you can see the level of detail improving um, from from the one scale to the to the scale that we are basically covering. Uh, the country at, at the moment. Uh, so it's quite a big endeavor. Um, and this forms the backbone of, uh, as I've, I've, I've mentioned, uh, a lot of the other work that we do as well. So not only mineral uh, exploration activities uh, and the oil and gas industry and all of this, but also uh, for infrastructure development, food security, um, hydrogeology, geohazards, uh, all of these things that have uh, societal benefit or potential societal impact um, and that's the main um, sort of baseline uh, point of departure that we work from uh, so currently we've um, we've covered about 13 percent uh, of the country uh, so it's it's obviously a long-term project that uh, that we've started uh, a couple of years back then um just to illustrate more than anything else, uh, but what we do is the geoscience, fundamental geoscience mapping uh, forms one component of a lot of other things that we do as well. So uh, these are just some examples of uh, geophysical surveys, both airborne and uh, ground geophysics, uh, geochemistry work. Um, you know, there's a lot of conceptual models and things published in literature uh, around mineral occurrences. So uh, what we do then is to take all of these different data sets uh, and start integrating them uh, to understand the regional mineral systems uh, in the main from a from a exploration perspective. Uh, and this is basically to try and fingerprint, you know, potential future occurrences. Uh, and then hopefully, you know, exploration companies uh, will can also then um, pick up some of this geoscience information. Uh, to streamline the process and and gain some grounds in terms of uh, resuscitating the mining uh, industry uh, in the main, especially from a, a exploration point. So this is one example of that. So um, uh, displayed on this uh, image is uh, what we call pegmatites. Uh, so these are rock types um, that are known to host lithium, uh, and we know lithium is. Uh, quite high in demand currently, especially for the electric vehicles and for batteries. Um, so there's been a lot of work, for instance, done uh, in the 60s and 70s by the formal, former geological survey. Uh, but during that time, it didn't really attract much attention because batteries wasn't such a big thing then. Um, but now with our new, more detailed approach and reassessing historical information with, with new data, um, we've actually uh, more than doubled the previous known occurrence of this uh, pegmatite body uh, in the Northern Cape province. Uh, and subsequent to that, um, you know, it seems like there's been a lot of exploration activity that had been attracted to this area 
uh, on the basis of this information that we've uh, that we've made available after doing the research. Uh, in fact, I believe there are actually some mines that are also opening uh, specifically for lithium uh, in that region. Uh, so that's just a direct illustration of how we are contributing to this five uh, percent of the global exploration expenditure and also our energy security uh, in the country. Then another big thing uh, to mention is obviously around uh, the talks of the uh, climate uh, mitigation, climate change mitigation. Uh, so one of the other things we've been looking at is carbon capture, storage and utilization. Uh, so this is also quite novel research from a geoscience perspective uh, where we want to sequestrate uh, CO2, anthropogenic CO2, uh, in a geological uh, uh, depository. Uh, so ultimately, um, we are doing the geological characterization of this, uh, which will be followed by uh, pilot scale injection uh, to test this whole concept. So uh, we are still busy with this work. It's uh, nearing its final stages of characterization. Um, but then ultimately this could potentially um, contribute quite significantly to our just energy uh, transition and the, and the climate change uh, trajectory that we are taking as a country. Uh, and also to mention, this would be uh, the first CCUS project uh, in the continent uh, if, if this is concluded. Uh, so we are very hopeful and, and actually quite optimistic about this at, at the current point. Um, and we've specifically also looked at the economics of the um, pilot stages uh, of, of this work uh, to have it closer to uh, point source emitters, uh, for instance, uh, in the Malanga region. The second last uh, example is, uh, for instance, the uh, integration of data sets that we do as well in terms of uh, groundwater risk studies. Um, so this is both for water supply purposes uh, as well as for uh, mine affected waters, uh, you know, typically acid mine drainage uh, type water. So we do quite a bit of work uh, around that as well to um, to compile for, as an example, these uh, uh, groundwater risks map uh, risk maps uh, to indicate where um, where water sources could be uh, potentially uh, vulnerable. Uh, that might need, you know, additional attention. Um, and that's typically, you know, where other role players would also come in. Uh, for instance, the part of Department of Water and Sanitation, uh, uh, Environmental um, uh, Affairs, Fisheries and Forestry, and, you know, private sector companies as well. Uh, and then lastly, by means of example, uh, I think we've all seen the devastation that geohazards can cause. Uh, I think in the media, it's been quite evident. Uh, sinkholes, earthquakes, landslides in the main, I think those are the big three that we have in, uh, in South Africa. Um, and uh, we all recall the, uh, the devastation that the, um, uh, the flooding and landslides caused in Etiquini and, and the Eastern Cape province as well uh, last year. Um, I think last estimations was reported around 25 billion rands worth of damage. Um, so from a geoscience perspective, what we do is uh, to assess these geohazards, uh, to define and characterize the sort of potential for occurrence. And um, the intention is then for that to be used by uh, local authorities or any developers um, uh, to um, reinforce safe and sustainable land use practices. Uh, so this is also one of that nexus points where geoscience then also finds expression, for instance, in uh, potentially in policy and bylaws uh, and and um, best practice guidelines. I think that's a that's an easy one. Um, and then lastly, I think um, one of the key things we've noticed uh, is I think as as geoscientists or scientists broadly. Uh, we are very good at communicating science to the scientific community. Um, but we've actually realized that we needed to change our approach. That's important. We need to do that as well. Um, but to change our approach to also make science more um, uh, sort of approachable and understandable to the broader and general public as well. Uh, 
uh, because at the end of the day, as a public entity, uh, we serve uh, all the people of the country. Uh, and then obviously the scientific side of things also uh, that will have its specific applications. Uh, so we've launched our digital platforms to, to make data and information available and accessible. Uh, those that are not subject to, you know, any confidentialities or that are still work in process. Um, so this is mainly part of our mandate uh, to be the custodian of all geoscientific data in, and information uh, in the country. Um, and then as a, as a concluding remark, what I wanted to mention as well. Uh, so obviously we being, uh, us being a public entity, um, I think in the world that we live in today, we, no one and nothing exists in a vacuum. Um, so I think, um, looking forward, uh, more and more, uh, collaboration will become quite significant and important. Um, I think there's a lot of expertise. Uh, across the board, especially if you start looking at entire value chains, uh, I think where we can uh, really leverage each other's uh, expertise and strengths. Uh, there's obviously the private sector and then uh, tertiary uh, uh, education institutions, higher education institutions as well. Um, yeah, so I wanted to to finish off with that. It's quite uh, difficult to uh, put everything that you do into a 15-minute talk. Um, but I hope that could give some sort of indication in terms of how our focus aligns to uh, contributing to socioeconomic development uh, in the country. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much.